everybody. Welcome to another episode of What a Hell of a Way to Die. It is Francis and Nate. Uh, new year, new you. Nate, how uh, how's the new year? How's 2019 out in England? It's nice. It's um, I feel as though I'm getting into the spirit of the place by complaining about the weather, even though in the grand scheme of things, it's like super mild compared to the Midwest, compared to anywhere, really. I mean, um, so the coldest that it's really gotten here in the past couple of days is it's gotten below freezing a couple of days at night, but not during the daytime. And that's the coldest it's been. You like, know, it's it, so mild here. It's, it's mind blowing. And yeah, I love it. it. It hasn't been too like I was expecting because we've had a couple of really mild winters. And, uh, you know, don't say climate change because it's the Midwest. Fucking climate change doesn't matter here. Like on on a on a week to week basis. But yeah, climate change in the Midwest basically means it'll be hotter in the summer and colder in the winter. And it'll still suck you around. You still <laughs> won't get spring and you won't get fall. Exactly. Just more extremes at the poles, basically. Yeah, there. Were, I I don't think we had spring last year. We had like a week worth of spring. Um, and but yeah, it's been really it's been a really mild winter. I'm just uh, uh I've got a nice little space heater on my back uh porch area that is keeping me warm because it's only like I don't know forty degrees maybe. I love how you're on your back porch with a space heater, and it's basically the Victorian mansion owner equivalent of your wife making you record your angry veteran calls in your car. Like, you're doing the angry videos, except it's a podcast. Right. And instead of being in your car or walking down the street to yell about libs, you're just in your screened porch. Well, the last time uh, we recorded and my, my dog, because my office is right next to the bedroom, um, and my office doesn't have a door, but the bedroom does. But when you know we start getting heated, we get some heated discussions in here. Then, then the kid wakes up because she she sleeps in our room. So then my wife gets irritated by that. And there's no there, there's no like you know good place to go with that. With, with you know either they wake up and then my daughter runs in in the middle of the podcast, being like, "Dad, what are you doing? Look at this! I found this! Look at this! Oh my god, this is so great!" Children are a blessing. Let me say that first. No, they're they're they're, abs- they're absolutely a blessing. But goddamn, um, but my three year old, my three year old will not shut the fuck up. I swear to God, she doesn't <laughs> stop talking. Um, so yeah, so she has a future in podcasting, is what you're saying. <laughs> she, uh, I have posted more than one picture. Like on a Sunday when I'm getting ready to record, she goes down, she gets her little uh, leap pad um, uh, laptop, and she gets an old microphone of mine, and then she'll sit down and like start singing into the microphone with the laptop open. Like not quite, but almost. You're almost there. That's that's what that's what we should be doing for our podcast. We should be singing Disney songs instead of yelling about politics and veteran stuff. I mean, she. I don't know how. I don't know how your singing voice is, but um, I. I can pull off "Let It Go," but I. Uh, you know, anything from Lion King is going to be a stretch for me, though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, I haven't really. Uh, ever since I was no longer obligated to run around singing cadence, my singing voice has not gotten any better. I would. I would hazard to say it's gotten worse, uh, with a few errant moments of yelling in karaoke at times. Um, but I try to keep those to a minimum cause I'm trying to be, you know, new, slightly more sober version of myself. Um, I've, but, uh, uh, I've cut back on the drinking. Decisions. I've cut back on the drinking myself. Uh, and so now I don't have an excuse when I wake up feeling like shit, which is fantastic. Oh, fucking Christ. I know. Right. <laughs> it's amazing. Up, it's like, I haven't had a drink in like, in like five days and I woke up with a headache today. I'm just like, why, why? I love it when you get to the certain threshold of aging where you wake up sore and you don't know why. You're like, I've rested. I drank water. I haven't had alcohol. I've been you know, stretching and exercising like I'm supposed to. And I woke up and it's just like, it feels like somebody hit me with a hammer in my sleep. But it's just like, no, it's just your, your, your body being like, oh, yeah, you thought it was just going to be easy, huh? Well, deal with it, bitch. Yeah, growing but old that being sucks. said, that being said, talking about, uh, talking about horrendous moments of growing old, uh, looking at recruiting stuff for the military and realizing that it's not aimed at you because it's aimed at fucking Gen Z gamers. And you realize like, wow, they're, 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 it's the, the mantle has been passed. I, I used to think it was weird when we had soldiers in our battalion who were born in the 90s. And now it's like, oh, no, 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 no. You, 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 you thought that was an indignity? Just, just you wait. Just you wait. You got something new. And that is uh, what appears to be Army Gaming Camp. So the recruiting has been... Weird, because I'm I'm still in the army, so I'm still around um, younger troops. But I'm around reservists, so maybe it's a little bit different. Generally, when I talk to our younger, you know, people in their twenties, you know, early twenties, um, late teens, like, why did you join? Like, you know, I'm. And it's always like, you know, it, it's it's not a hey, why'd you join? I'm public affairs. I like to talk about these things. It's like, why the fuck are you here, dude? What are you doing? What are you what What are you doing this for? Um, fuck is now, wrong with you yeah right now granted i'm in a unit that doesn't deploy and i'm in a unit that is full of pokes so i get it you know there's a lot of people that get jobs that are uh useful for them uh outside some of the, but a lot of them is just like man college 
uh, healthcare, um, didn't have a job. I work at a T-Mobile store. You know, I, I work at a T-Mobile store and can be fired at any point in time. I need some kind of, you know, basic steady income. So uh, I get that. And, and so generally, I'm surrounded by people who it's kind of a financial uh, obligation rather than any kind of moral or patriotic obligation. Some of them do. Some of them are like, well, you know, also, I guess I love America. But like it, in that way that I did it, like we're patriots. The, the reason for me joining patriotism was like number seven on the list behind I don't know what the fuck I'm doing with my life and I need somebody to make me stop smoking weed. Um, you know, and then patriotism was a little bit further down. It's like, well, I guess also I should do something for this country. So, I mean, the way that I've always heard it phrased from people is like, you know, your, your first enlistment or your first hitch, if you're an officer is, uh, is sort of a, what am I going to do with my life kind of thing? And then like you, you, you steadily build up the ability to convince yourself it was patriotism with each successive re-enlistment. But it's like, if it, if a 19 year old private is being honest with you, like it's not, it's not patriotism in, in the sense that. Of like, I got to do something for my country. That's just what you say to drill sergeants. They don't fucking smoke you. Because <laughs> I love my country. Uh, also, the uh, continuing with your your enlistments is also because you, you've realized that you've done nothing else to learn any other skill other than what the military has taught you. And um, sure, there's a lot of things in the military that uh, do cross level over into the civilian world, but not like, you know, not in a very easy way. Like, I can't get out, I can't become a combat medic and then get out of the military and become a paramedic. Like, I still have to go to paramedic school and pass paramedic class for it. I have a good baseline, but it's not like I'm out and no, I can go be a paramedic anywhere I want now. Uh, so, a lot of times also people are just like, fuck, dude, I'm like 30 and I have a kid now and a wife and, you know, a, a mortgage and a car. Like, I can't quit and go you know, start over somewhere else. So, retention... Retention seems pretty easy because, uh, you know, the retention NCO should just walk up to you. just like, the fuck else are you going to do, bitch? That's right. Sign up. <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't know if I ever told you the story, but um, when I was out processing, when I was doing, um, what is it called? Uh, the I forget the acronym. And of course, it's, it's Sunday afternoon and I haven't had any alcohol and I've had plenty of caffeine. So I have no excuse to not remember the acronym. Um, I think it's ACAP, the Army Career Alumni Program yep. or whatever. ACAP, yeah. Um, yeah, and I was doing ACAP, and we were getting harangued to join the reserves by a, you know, forty-year in-service reservist who was doing like a one-year hitch in Korea, um, and he was the retention guy and for the reserves for the garden reserves, and he was trying to get everybody to join the reserves. But the thing about it is, is that you know when you do ACAP, they break you out into two groups. There's the, the people going through ACAP who are retirees. And the people who are going through ACAP for any other reason. So they just assume everyone in the room for the other reason is getting kicked out of the military, even if you absolutely are not. Like in my case, I'm a seven year in service captain. And I'm just like, hey, I'm done. I've done my time in the army. I've decided I'm getting out of the army. I'm going to grad school. I have to sit through the same thing next to private from our SECO who's getting kicked out because he refuses to take a shower. I'm not kidding. <laughs> and I remember the, the, uh, the, the, the speech this guy was giving us, right? And it, so it was like this. Hey, you'll never find none of you is going to ever have a job that's going to give you as good of health care and dental care as you're going to have in the reserves. Um, True. This is such a good deal. It's like 60 or 70, 70 bucks and uh, a month, and you're going to get your whole family covered. And some of, one of the soldiers who was this, this uh, female private who was getting kicked out, I think either for either pattern of misconduct or because this is fucked up. But in the army, if, you, if, if a, a female soldier gets pregnant, they will kick her out of the military if she's not married and doesn't have a family care plan. And so, like, lots of I, I saw lots of privates who got pregnant in Korea and just got kicked out of the military. And there's it doesn't matter what their MOS is; it doesn't matter if it was if it was you know high value it, to, the, to the military. They don't care; they'll kick you out. And to some extent, I mean, we could, we could dig into that. We should definitely dig into that with people who know more on the topic about like the sort of vindictiveness of like commanders and first sergeants who just hate female soldiers and want to kick them out. But that was happening, right? And so, any one of these one of this uh, the soldiers, she she says. That's that's not true, Sergeant. You know, doctors, lawyers, people like that—they have great health care, better than this. And the recruiting sergeant just goes, <laughs> "Yeah, well, I don't see a whole lot of future doctors and lawyers in this room." <laughs> and I was just like, <laughs> "I was like, you motherfucker, you can, yeah, well, you're right, you're right, Sergeant. We can't all aspire to be forty-year reservists with no combat patch. But I mean, you know, like, let's not talk about your career. Let's talk about things moving forward. Um, and so, yeah, I just <laughs> was always shocked by that because it's like, on one hand, he's not wrong that the benefits you get in the reserves, especially if you're working like a terrible job, are uh, are far better, far, far better than you would get in the civilian world. And in a way, they're sort of like a holdover from the days when like that was what you were you got from a civilian job. And now basically nobody gets that. But at the same time, um, <laughs> the army, the army is a uh, well, it's running up against the fact that 
there are very few reasons a rational person would join at this point, if not for the benefits. Yeah. And and so now the military has to field like a Fortnite team to, you know, go on. Because let's let's be honest, like video games have been have long been a, uh, a recruiting haven for like white nationalists and shit. Like it's not hard to find uh, people who game. And I'm saying all gamers because I play video games. Um, we have, and I, you know, we have, uh, we have a video game podcast, you know, episode coming out. Um, so I definitely don't want to do this, you know, don't fucking at me with not all gamers, motherfuckers. I know I'm talking about like the, 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 you know, 16, the heated gaming moment people. Well, well that, and also just like the kids, the, the, the kids who are like growing up, like in, I, it is weird to me when I read that one of the, that like the biggest social network for kids uh, when I say kids, I mean 18 and under is YouTube. Um, and because I don't, I use YouTube to like, look up, you know, how do I make rice milk? How do I do, you know, this, how do I fix <laughs> this thing on my car? And then I don't go back to YouTube. Um, but there are people who's, you know, the, the younger generation spend, you know, hours of their time on YouTube, just falling down YouTube holes, watching videos of just all kinds of different things. So, uh, and of course, at some point in time, you're going to come across like a, an hour and a half long Sargon of Akid or um, fucking Jordan Peterson sitting there telling you about, you know, women don't want to touch penis because uh, women are the devil, not because you don't wash penis. Uh, but if you wash I, uh, penis, I, maybe maybe one will touch it. One of the best takes I've ever seen on the Jordan Jordan Peterson YouTube video phenomenon in terms of like nailing the ideology behind it was he went on this riff about what if actually the Sentinelese Island was like they were super advanced like Wakanda, but because they didn't listen to their version of Jordan Peterson, feminism made them regress so far that now they're a Stone Age tribe. And it's like, that's the dumbest shit you've ever heard in your life. But he's he, what he he's obviously making a joke. But that's not that far off the mark from the ideologies that kids who play video games are being exposed to on a constant basis on on because they're watching YouTube live and Twitch streams of gamers who are just like, oh, wow, I've got you here being really good at gaming. By the way, did you know that, that women are supposed to women are supposed to be weak and subjugated, but uh, but but Democrats and feminism have stopped that from happening. <laughs> Do you, you need a trad wife? And it's like, oh, fuck's sake. Yeah. It, so so there's a lot of there there's a lot of moldable minds out there. And and that is true of anybody who is under the age of 18. Um the you know a, a 15 16 year old brain is just putty that you can do anything with. Um very very much looking forward to having uh, a teenager that yells at me but also that I can manipulate. Um because that that's you know that that's the the perfect like time when they're trying to to, to form their opinions and trying to figure out, you know, who do I want to be and what do I want to be? And you got to get to them. You know, you got to get to them before the Nazis do or before the army does because that's what the army is doing now too. Um, I was going to say, I mean, that, doesn't that, it strikes me <laughs> as hilarious in that comparison because what do army recruiters do? The same thing that Sergeant Sargon of Akkad does, which is try to get them when they're young and convince them that, uh, that uh, you know, there's nothing cooler than being in the army. It's like what that doesn't take into consideration is, it's, it's yes, not. You, you might see, you might see, you might see a helicopter doing a live fire from 500 meters away looking through binos, but then you'll also see a roadblock that you're standing at for hours on end for no reason when you're doing bullshit details. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that this is specifically grooming because it's not a weird pedophile thing but it is a it is definitely a hey fellow kids why don't you come on over here and check out how cool it is to you know shoot a javelin missile at somebody um so uh, recruiting you know re recruiting is is a weird <clears throat> place that you know even when you know i was being recruited in in 2000 um you know it was just a very squishy kind of thing but it was easier back then my my recruiter said it was easy to find people back in 2000 because you know there hadn't been a war in a while and you know people were like yeah sure why not i'll go fucking do a uh do do a, a stitch and uh and you know get a little bit of money um of course you know now 18 years on um a little bit harder and not just because war is shitty and stupid because it's easy to convince people to go do stupid shitty wars um, I, you know, look at anybody who's like, not, not to disparage any of my, uh, of my, you know, veterans who are in their twenties and still in and proud to serve that I, I get it. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to say, I, mean, I think that, I think that like that, that you either, you're either susceptible to that argument or you're not, you know what I mean? That's the thing. Kids are either susceptible to that argument that actually you're going to die in the war and that's stupid or they're not. I mean, there's lots, there's lots of things that you can do that you can die doing. And 
when people see the military, they think about joining the military. Yeah, there's that risk, but there's also people out there saying it's badass. There's also people saying, oh, my job fucking rules. I get to kick in doors and shoot people. And, you know, if you're a, a teen boy who loves video games, that sounds badass. You know, like if you love playing, I don't know, fucking Far Cry or something like that. In the same in the same vein, like if you're, you know, and so it's the same thing with like the morality argument. Like when I, when people tell, come to me and they're like, I want to be a Navy SEAL or I want to be a Green Beret or whatever. Like if they're past the morality argument, if I say what you're going to do, you're going to regret, like you're not actually going to be fighting the service of anything besides like terrible failed policy and inertia. But that only works on some people. If it doesn't work on them, the only thing that I've ever found that can really work is tell people like, uh, the attrition rate is super high and they own you for five years, even if you fail. So I hope you really want to be a Green Beret because if you if you don't make it, like you also can hopefully really want to be, I don't know, a fucking infantry Joe or uh, I don't know, whatever MOS they want to class you as when you get sent to some bullshit unit. Like, because there's only a certain extent to which the uh, an argument like what you just described, Francis, the, the like, wow, war sucks. Some people will be like, you're right, war sucks. I'm not going to join the military. Other people will be like, yeah, whatever. So does working at Waffle House. Yeah. And, and you don't get, well, I mean, Waffle House in America in 2019, you may get shot at uh, about as much as you would get in Afghanistan. At least in Afghanistan, you get combat pay for it, I suppose. Well, shit, Waffle House in Washington State, you get $15 an hour. Apparently, $15 an hour working 40 hours a week at 48 weeks a year is more money pre-tax than a private in the Army makes. So I haven't seen a, I haven't seen uh, the the rehash of that stupid meme of uh, you know you don't deserve fifteen dollars an hour because here's what a, a U.S. Army private makes um, you know where it's like yeah. they don't make shit money and they you know work twenty four seven and blah, blah blah which like none of it, it literally none of it is true um, and you get a shitload of amazing benefits as you know an E one private. But I mean, I think we've talked about it before that like if it wasn't for the military or if, if it wasn't for, you know, um, shitty college prospects, like either you can go to a, a, a little hole in the wall college or you can um, go tens of thousand dollars in debt. Uh, if it wasn't for lack of health insurance and health care uh, and if it wasn't lack for of, uh, of jobs, the military would fucking dry up. Um, and we we're seeing that with a with a good economy, like you know, I think I I I think the one thing that I've uh, I've shrugged my shoulders on with Trump is like, yeah, the economy is great right now. Um, it's not great for everybody, I know. The middle class is disappearing, but it is unemployment is to a point now where nobody wants to join the army in places like Seattle because why the fuck would you? I wouldn't if I could go at wa- go to Waffle House and make like at least somewhat of a decent living. You know, where I could live comfortably, maybe with a roommate and not get shot at? Hell yes. And we, and weed is legal. Yeah, and weed is legal. Yeah, Holy I mean, like, shit. Like, Seattle, like, Seattle it, it, just needs like a hundred more days of sunshine and it sounds like paradise to me. I mean, I, I look at it with... Uh, so it's just funny to me because when I look at this article that, we, that we're linking to, um, you know, the headline says, new in 2019, Army is pulling out all the stops to attract Generation Z. Um, I'm going to read the first couple of paragraphs here just to give you a, a, a sense of the way this is framed. There were audible sighs in the room back in October when Training and Doctrine Command boss General Stephen Townsend told reporters that it had been years since the Army had put out a new, new recruiting commercial. Senior leadership has pointed to low unemployment rates and a high instance of childhood obesity as negatively affecting the number of potential recruits. But as part of its push to, to move out of its old school recruiting ways, the Army is overhauling its marketing strategy. Quote, it's a little embarrassing to tell you that or sit here and tell you all that we haven't had a new commercial in two or three years, unquote, Townsend said at the press conference. As of last week, the ones that are running today are two to three years old. About a week later that had changed, however, when the Army dropped its new Warriors Wanted campaign, the Army has also stepped up its hometown recruiter multimedia, recording short greetings from soldiers currently serving. And then in November, Army Recruiting Command put out word that it was looking for a few dozen soldiers to join either a functional fitness team or esports team aimed at marketing to two niches of American youth with skills or interests that could translate to service. Um, so functional fitness is basically working out and esports is playing video games i love so i love crossfit crossfit and video games in the future um wars will be decided where every country sends one single person we all parachute them onto an island and whoever uh wins at the end is the winner of the war (laughs) all war is going to be one is going to be one v a hundred well i mean 
I love the idea that Fortnite translates into the military service because in the grand scheme of things, making shit out of cardboard and 100 mile an hour tape and 550 cord is actually not that distant to what you do in Fortnite. So it's like, hey, you know, maybe the person with the brain that helps them succeed at Fortnite is the, the person that can help them be in the military. Assuming that like their, you know, rotator cuffs don't break the first time they have to do pushups because they grew up in a fucking veal cage and have never done sports in their entire life. And then I, some dipshit is making them do army PT that like has literally no bearing in any kind of sports medicine and just watching people just get orthopedic injuries left and right before they even get out of basic training i'm very excited for the first like uh, the the first Fortnite team that we feel like we a Fortnite squad that we actually put like okay guys build yourselves a uh, uh a base here and like <clears throat> we come back a week later and it's just like four dudes building the tallest tower that they can just be like we're looking for the ceiling <laughs> we're looking to see what the ceiling on this thing is and like they, I mean, they only the only way they come in and out of uh, of the base is uh, via bus, and they all have to thank the bus driver when they get off. A little bit of Fortnite joke there for you kids out there. You always thank your bus yeah, driver. Yeah, I've 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 uh, I've never played Fortnite because I actually I have a gaming machine, but my gaming machine is also my studio editing machine, and so I keep it in the studio so that I just work on it. And if I'm away from home, why why would I want to be playing games in the office when I could just get my work done and go home? So, so I, I haven't gamed in a while. I um I made a conversation with my my nephew is 15 and the way he and I bond as we talk about video games even though I really don't play anymore but I keep up with them and uh it's funny he's like the one teenager that I know who hates Fortnite and he's just like I hate it I hate it so much I'm just like but it's fun he's like it's stupid and I I think he hates it because everybody else likes it so much um though it there is like I I will say that I'm not very good at Fortnite because it takes a very special brain to be able to do Minecraft and uh, player unknown battleground at the same time like quickly like when i say i mean like a beautiful mind kind of thing to to do that very well shout out to all yeah, of I our mean, fortnite I, players out there but holy shit man y'all got you y'all, y'all got some brains that are doing some things that my synapses cannot do yeah and i do think that when it comes to those sorts of skill sets that it, it definitely helps you know when when kids are young to be able to adapt to those sorts of things but at the same time i keep thinking like what is the army i mean okay esports can attract people and not everybody is going to be a multi-million dollar earning star video game player. So if you're not, you know, if you're in the esports realm and then the army sounds attractive to you, maybe you want to join it. But I mean, I just feel like the level of stupidity you have to put up with in the army is going to turn people off so much that even if the army is able to meet or in- improve its recruiting numbers by recruiting from gamers, that those gamers are probably going to be very disenchanted soldiers when they just deal with this, the, the utter stupidity of what they have to do on a regular basis. And when they're like, oh, you like gaming? Well, we're going <laughs> to we're gonna have you play fucking VBS2 in the computer lab. A uh, little, little in-joke for all you army heads out there because uh, I think it's Virtual Battlefield Simulator version 2. It's like one of the army, it's like an army <laughs> video game and it sucks. It's so it sucks terrible. so bad. It's so fucking awful. It's like, can you imagine you, you bring your gaming rig to your barracks room and like it just gets just gets thrown out the window like now nah, you're playing you're playing VBS2 in the computer lab on these, these shitty ass Lenovo machines that we got 10 years ago. Like it's, it, to me, this is going to sound like if when they say sports fitness like they're talking about crossfitters they're talking about like performative fitness things like people who do fitness competitions that are you know along those lines that to me seems like they're more likely to find people because every crossfitter secretly wants someone to come up to me like your country needs you and make them join the army and so in a way and crossfit is so into just like just cuddling the balls of troops and cops so much that I feel as though that's a community that they would probably be able to recruit from more successfully. Like, but that, that to me gets to the heart of the issue here. Recruiting is to the goal of recruiting is to get recruits and get them basically through MEP successfully and onto one station unit training or OSIT. Like (laughs) after that, they're the goddamn army's problem. After that, they're their units problem. And, 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 so when you're looking at recruits, are you looking at recruits who, once they get past MEPS and into OSIT, are they going to be, or, or, or graduate from OSIT and get onto their units, are they going to be soldiers who aren't complete fuck-ups, who aren't miserable, you know, who aren't um, co- requiring the expenditure of more energy than they're putting into the unit? My, and like, I, I got to say, my favorite is whenever you come across one of those soldiers where you realize that like, the sol- it's not the soldier's fault that they're dumb. Uh, or bad at being a soldier and you just like you have to think back to like well a recruiter had to find you and push you through and then the basic training drill sergeants had to allow this and continue pushing you through 
and now you're here. And now I'm considered a bad leader if I don't fucking make something out of you. Can you just go home? Can we do that? Can you just do that, please? I, I love this idea too um, from the other article that we found on, on Fox News, which is premium angry grandpa bait with its headline, Army Stepping Up Recruitment in 22 Left-Leaning Cities, Recruiting the Libs, Betraying America's Heroes from Within. Um, We're all going to be communists now, well. bitch. Look at this. Every single West Point cadet is going to have to wear a Red Army uniform now because they're going to make Spencer Rapone the commandant of West Point. Uh, the libs are taking over. And as we all know, libs and communists, li- libs and, and North Korean Juche practitioners are the same. Um, as soon as you recruit from Kansas City, which is on the list of famously lib cities, uh, who knows? I mean, like next thing you know, it's just going to be year zero. We're all going to be farming rice with human skulls. Like that's what happens when you recruit people from Kansas City, Missouri. I don't know about Kansas City, Kansas. I heard it's slightly more conservative there, but still. Anyway, here's the copy from, the, from this, this story. After missing its recruiting goal last year for the first time since 2005, side note, 2005, I wonder what was going on that year. Some (laughs) some shit. The army is crossing the American divide of red military country and blue civilian country. Yes. I love this cop talk. Just fucking shoot it in my veins. It makes my dick so hard. Going to 22 left-leaning cities for new enlistees. Guys, they've had recruiting stations everywhere. I knew a guy who was recruiting in fucking Marin County, California in like the height of the Iraq war. The idea that the army isn't going there is just proof that these people, like, their brain has turned into fucking overcooked ramen in their skull. Yeah. Who would think that the military would start doubling efforts in, like, the 4% of the country where 60% of the population is? Weird. I was going to say, weird. Damn, they're going to those li- those lib bastions, those lib citadels where everyone fucking lives. <laughs> like, where there are people. Nate, what we need are more... Recruiting stations out in the mountains of Montana to get um, those moose and those those wild goats to join the military. Obviously, putting you know recruiting humans in cities is just a stupid idea. I mean, considering that our country literally gave Puerto Ricans citizenship in like in the nineteen teens so that they could forcibly draft them to fight in World War One, <laughs> I'm not putting it past anyone with regard when there's a recruiting problem to take some extreme measures, but. It's it's like go to native reservations. Like you want your roads plowed? Well, you all have to join the army then. I mean, literally, it, it, you you start to see that 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 sort of attitude. But in this case, I feel this article is framed just it, it it's it's primed. It's been focus grouped to get as many grandpas angry because they're thinking when they're reading this, like, oh my god, they're are they really recruiting from those others from those libs? But like you said, and the, the idea that this is shocking to you depends on you believing that that map that shows all the congressional districts and like most of them are red because most people live in cities and those districts are smaller. Uh, that, that's reality. You know, that 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 actually everyone in America is it, it, basically everywhere you go in America is cowboys except for the the hideous libs living in their disgusting cities where where gender rules supreme. Um, anyway, this quote goes: We want to go into Boston. Oh. Whoa! Boston has Massachusetts has a fucking Republican governor. Boston's the most <laughs> racist city in America. Like, what are you talking about? Pittsburgh, yes, Western Pennsylvania, famously lib, incredibly lib. When I think lib, when I think Nancy Pelosi loving insane, like, first of all, I mean, my brain is melting when I even try to think of a good example because anywhere that Fox News readers think is lib is actually relatively center right. It's just it's not full on. Pitchforks burning, yeah. like they're not, they're not they're not burning mosques twenty four seven. So like it's not it's not conservative enough for them. The only thing like, that the cities on this what, list. What lib means is that when you look at an electoral map during twenty sixteen, what little bits went blue, and that's a lib. That's a lib city to them. And I have to tell you, um, I'm from St. Louis, which is a lib city, Kansas City, a lib city, Columbia, which is in the middle, which is almost a lib city. Um, guess what? If you're a po- if you have a population under a hundred thousand, you're probably that's the only conservative cities above a hundred thousand. You're probably going to be a lib city. Well, you, the idea that basically they're looking at the red state, blue state when it comes to military recruiting, as if I mean most soldiers come from Texas and California. Why? Because they're the most populous states in America. <laughs> I can't tell you how many soldiers I had that were from California. Most of them weren't even that left. They just like literally like my 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 Californian soldiers were relatively mellow when it came to gay people and weed. And that was the only difference between them and like a soldier from Mississippi. I mean, just being honest. So this is this is a dumb framing. But their quote is we want to go into Boston, Pittsburgh, Kansas City. General Major General Frank Muth 
great name, the head of Army Recruiting Command told New York Times, these are places with a large number of youth who just don't know what the military is about, unquote. Muth told the Times that the Army is looking to enlist young American typo, usually bound for corporate office work to do their patriotic duty enticed by the prospects of public service, travel, and adventure. Quote, you want to do a gap year, the general added? Come do your gap year in the army, unquote. Come um, do your gap four years. <laughs> come do your gap. Come come do your gap orthopedic injury in the army. Like Australians, Australians get concussions that harm them for the rest of their lives doing gap year in Laos where they're fucking just taking drugs and going down dangerous rock slides. You can do that, but getting thrown out of an airplane by a dude who's a, with serious with a serious anger disorder come do your gap year and get night terrors for the rest of your life (laughs) despite pouring an extra 200 million into bonuses and approving some additional waivers for bad conduct or health issues army recruitment fell short last year of goals by almost 6,500 soldiers army leader said in september they signed up about 70,000 new active duty recruits in the fiscal year that ends september 30th well below the 76,500 needed the army is planning to grow to 500,000 by 2024 meaning increased recruiting goals initially the army was supposed to recruit 80,000 this year but that was cut to 76,500 in april as more soldiers re-enlisted um this makes me laugh because when i was getting out of the army they were cutting the army left and right they were doing boards to kick people out they were doing um all sorts of things for anybody with any misconduct in their file. And I mean, I haven't been out of the army. I have not been out of the army five years. It'll be five years in April. Yeah. Like, <laughs> when, when I joined, they're already, they're already going back. Shit. When I joined back when we were still in BDUs and, uh, the, the PTs were, um, were the, the, the sweatpants and sweat, uh, sweaters and everything. <clears throat> Our drill sergeants specifically told us, they're like, you know, <clears throat> we don't give a fuck. We'll kick you out. Like if you don't if you don't want to be here now to be fair the drill sergeants did like you know um, at one point I had uh, a bit of a breakdown and they you know pulled me aside and they were like hey look don't fucking just quit just because you're having a bad day just you know you're good like it was one of the few times the drill sergeants was just like we don't think you're a fuck up so you're probably gonna be fine so just chill the fuck out and go back and get in line and you'll be fine give it a day and you'll be fine and I was. So, you know, um, but for the most, there are other people, like we had people left and right, just getting, you know, just getting kicked out. Not like for any, I'm going to say left and right. I mean, my, my class of 60 plus, like 62, I think we probably had about, uh, maybe about, I want to say seven or eight that didn't graduate for like, you know, for, for running, for trying to leave, not, uh, and one, one dude for injury, um, so, you know, back then they had no problem with it. Now I have seen now people who are really should not be in the military who got pushed through. I mean, when I was, uh, when I was getting out, a friend of mine that I knew from special forces training had gotten a DUI when he was uh, in group and it had, or actually I take that back. He hadn't gotten a DUI. He had gotten uh, a memorandum of reprimand for drinking while deployed. And it was in his permanent file. And they, even though he was a senior E6 promotable to E7, they kicked him out of the army because he didn't meet the, the basically the character requirements anymore. And I mean, the idea that you're going to, I don't know in terms of bullshit army numbers, how much many millions of dollars it costs per soldier to train a soldier for special forces. And you kick this guy out. I don't know if they let him back in. They might, they might not, who knows. But the, uh, to give you an idea of how much they were kicking people out in 2014, when because I applied for a waiver to get out to get out early, and they let me out. Um, to give you an idea of how how strict this was happening, um, this is all this is hearsay, of course, but I have no reason to not believe it. Uh, a friend of mine w- had worked at the Army Personnel Directorate, uh, what they call Army G1, and they <laughs> they were going through the officer board because they were doing um, basically officer selection boards to retain people. And they were kicking out a bunch of captains, a bunch of majors, a bunch of lieutenant colonels. Um, and in one case, be, there were <laughs> there were two officers, actually I think it was three officers, two majors and a lieutenant colonel who the board determined should not be allowed to be retained in the army because they didn't have enough um, above center of mass blocks on their evaluation reports, which typically gets given to people. Like one of the things you'll notice when with army personnel stuff is uh, if you are, um, if you're not in a command position, if a raider only has a certain number of ACOM or above center of mass blocks, he can give to people on his ratings. He'll give them to the people in command and not to like the staff and support people, even if their performance is exemplary, because to him, to, to them, to the commander, the, the ACOM block has to go to, to the other people who are in command, uh, which is kind of a bullshit thing. It's like, no matter, you could have a, 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 you could be the best staff officer in the world, but you may not get an ACOM block. Um, it just really just depends on your raider. 
Anyway, I'm telling you the story because the board was so strict that I, I'm sure this got reversed because it's so absurd. I can't even fucking fathom. But they wanted to kick out two majors and one lieutenant colonel because they didn't have uh, enough ACOM blocks. Um, they were in Delta Force. But they were like, well, you haven't had enough leadership positions yet. Like, well, it's like, because when you're in Delta Force, like, by the time you get there, you have to kind of wait your turn to be in command, but you've passed the fucking operator training to be a Delta Force guy. Like, something tells me you're okay to stay in the army. But no, the board wanted to kick them out because they were that stringent. And that was, I, I may have told the story before. I mean, I'm an old man at this point when it comes to this podcast and I've, we've been doing it so long, I've probably told that story before. But I have to emphasize that just as recently as less than five years ago, they were kicking people out left and right on the officer side and on the enlisted side uh, because they were like, nope, we're shrinking the army. And now we're right back to worst of the Bush years level, level of terrible fucking army not meeting their retention and recruiting goals. And they're having to like, you know, recruit guys who emotionally, mentally, uh, conscientiously uh, whatever adverbs we can think of should not be there yeah like and, just should not be there and, and you know in 2018 is uh is a lot different than you know like we're shrinking the army and the army doesn't need to be bolstered back up we're not going back into a big conflict i mean regardless of how you think things might go with iran or korea or whatever we do not currently have a push to get more soldiers in or retain soldiers beyond our normal recruiting goals. So there's not like a, you know, not like the surge years where we're just like, we got to take in anybody. You're 42 and you're and a white nationalist, fucking fine. Come on in. As long as you don't have too many felonies, we'll, you'll be fine for a couple of years. You know, <clears throat> we're, we're at literally just at a point where like we can't even, you know, the military can't even maintain its head above water because fucking nobody wants to go to war. I mean, I, I, I you know, the, the article that you said, talks about how things are too, you know, nice in places like Seattle, but honestly, I feel like it's going that way everywhere. And, you know, some of these generals are like, well, I mean, we want people to come do their patriotic duty. Fucking people don't feel that way anymore. And nor should they. Like, honestly, you shouldn't feel like you owe anything, uh, owe anything to a country that you were just born into. Um, you know, unless like, also, also, if you want to be patriotic, fucking run for office or work in your community or something. Don't go shoot brown people over on the other side of the world. Yeah, I mean, it, it's one of those things where the the veil has been lifted in the sense that it's very difficult to convince someone that what they're doing is both beneficial to the United States in terms of security, or and also beneficial to whatever country you're supposedly in. I mean, there's the there's the we have to protect Fortress America from brown people kind of patriotic argument and then there's the white man's burden we're going to go fix these countries because they can't fix themselves argument and neither one of those is true and i think that in the year of our lord 2019 it's very difficult to convince yourself that either of those is worth your time your effort and potentially your life some people will but i don't blame people for not and and that gets to the heart of the true source of military recruiting which is economic hardship yep and I mean, quite frankly, that's what drives it. And so we, we were having this conversation that in the long run, you could obviously afford Medicare for all, free college, free trade school, you know, universal rent control, public banking, all these things for a fraction of what we spend every year um, on the Department of Defense. But also, I think you wouldn't be able to staff the military with people if there wasn't so much economic and personal misery in the United States. And it's what drives it. It's what drove it. Not in the sense that people are at the very, very bottom of the rung, like near homeless levels of destitution, but there are people that just don't have, there are not a lot of great options moving forward, you know, things that they can, they can do or what, what they have available just isn't interesting to them. And we've talked about this a lot on the show. Like, what, what would you do with that kind of impulse? What would you do with restless, youthful energy? How do you channel that into something that's good? I would much rather have some kind of like civilian conservation corps style thing that's like a regimented unit of young people who go and plant trees and like fix fucking infrastructure things than having it be folks going and manning checkpoints in Libya or Syria or Iraq or Afghanistan or, where, or, or Kuwait or Germany or Kyrgyzstan or Panama. Yeah, there, you know, I could just keep going down the list. There, there's a local, uh, a local urban farmer that pulls um, like twice a year. He gets uh, uh, volunteers from the local, uh, from SLU, I think, or one of our local. Um, it's a, it's a Jesuit college, and you know, it, I live in a, a very, I live in a, a, a mixed neighborhood that is, you know, low to medium income, 
and he has a lot of urban farms around. He's like, I, you need four hours of, uh, of, of, you know, work of, uh, with volunteer work. It's like, come on over, you know, start plant stuff for me, you know, plant stuff for me because this is where, you know, the, these are vegetables that go out into the community, you know, something, and the, those kids are always, and it's not, you know, you guys plant, you guys take, um, trash bags and clean up the alleys. And put everything in the dumpsters, you know, just in this general like half mile area. Big, big group of you go that way. Big group of you go that way. You know, walk three blocks, pick up everything, all the trash, put it into into the dumpsters. Like that is, and and like I go and I help him out because he knows me and, and he knows that I can help. You know, direct people and get give orders because I'm a sergeant. And that is always, you know, I I always just be like, yes, this is what you kids should be doing. This is what, you know, uh, a 19, 20, 20 year old, you want to do a gap year, you know, and spend time, go, you know, what, what is the, the, the Peace Corps or something, or just do something. Yeah, but the Peace Corps, the Peace Corps requires, requires you to have a college degree. And I think the Peace Corps is, um, is a, in a way, but doing I mean, the Peace Corps is kind of like a, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a class and status symbol because to be able to do the Peace Corps, you have to be in a position where you're not going to be in debt right. from college and you're going to come from a family that can help you like right. if you need it. Yeah, and so invariably I, that... It, I, I know. I'm, I don't mean like literally. I just, you know, I, there, there's there's way other ways to be, there's way better ways to be patriotic. <clears throat> you know, just starting a small gar- uh, vegetable garden that's near the edge of your yard and just putting a sign out that says free vegetables to whoever wants them. You know, I think is way more of a value to America, especially if you live in a community that um, is walkable and maybe low to medium income, where people might have might have you know food insecurity and might not have uh, access to fresh vegetables. And you know, I feel like you're doing more there than you ever would well, yeah, joining the I, army. And and it's just interesting to me that <laughs> that we frame a thing as patriotic and selfless when it has a huge stake in securing the supply chain for people who are making a lot of money off of America's position in the world, whether it's through uh, defense and defense appropriations, contracting, things along those lines, or just industries that are floated to the top basically by the, by defense money, um, even if they're not overtly defense defense industries. I mean, and so to me, it's strange because when we talk about selflessness, like I, I just don't believe that that I find there's something suspect in trying to funnel this urge to do something with meaning into a massive, rigid, normalizing organization that exploits people, harms people, and also makes a lot of people very, very wealthy, if if not directly in the sense of, I mean, senior military people tend to retire quite quite well off, not not wealthy by American standards at all, but definitely better off than the average American, if not directly in that regard, then indirectly in the sense of when you think about the kind of money that, that uh, when you think about the kind of money that defense contractors and senior people who retire and go work on the boards of Raytheon are making, I, I those companies, those organizations, those supply chains can't be successful without 19-year-old privates sit, stand, sitting in watchtowers, standing in watchtowers throughout the developing world um, being exploited, yeah. The most flat, flat, and that's the and most that's, radical, that's the not funny version, but the most radical thing you can do is not make money for some big conglomerate in some way. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, which makes you apparently makes you crazy. That that makes that makes you insane. That makes you a shut in. That makes you the Unabomber in modern economic parlance because well, you're and it's hard to do. Let's let's be honest. Like I mean, yeah. even even growing a I mean, garden, I'm when when I when I make a vegetable garden, I still got to give my money to Big Seed. Yeah, I was gonna say. I mean, we 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 talk about how we've we uh we've broken free of the man, but we also have regular jobs, and a huge cut of what we make gets goes to oh sure the entire goes to to Patreon, the corporate corporation, you know, like or like my so actual yeah, my my nine to five job that you know makes yeah. like and this is like it's I I I would never tell anybody quit your job um that that gives you your livelihood, but you know what <clears throat> little things that you can do on the side are all, you know are more like you know that. That's what you should, you know. That that's what you could focus on more than ever joining the military. In short, don't join the army. Is our is our forever message on this podcast. And if you yeah, got to join so something, what, join the fucking air force. Yes, that's true. Or the coast guard. I mean, for for better or worse, the coast guard <laughs> is deployed mostly to America, doing America things. Um, I I, uh, I would also say too that something that we want to talk about really quickly, which I think we can we can shoehorn in here at the end, is there's not a lot of room for faith in leadership in the military because 
you can see how, despite whatever people, have, whatever the the hot tub residents of you know um, Radio Free Tom and John Schindler's buddy groups have said, the generals and the the, the gray beards and the the mandarins of the State Department and those folks aren't stopping us, aren't saving us from any of this shit. And just recently, General uh, Stanley McChrystal and d- got felt the wrath of Donald Trump's terrible tweets, um, but McChrystal. Being lionized, and, and McChrystal, for for in, in all fairness, uh, McChrystal wrote uh, an op-ed specifically calling for gun control for AR-15s and that variant of rifle after the uh, Orlando Pulse nightclub massacre. So, in a way, in the in in the, the conception of most morons in the Trump world, he was already a lib. I would I argue that McChrystal is very much not. And if you know anything about Stan McChrystal, you know about he helped to he, he he was not able to achieve the goals he set out to achieve in Afghanistan. He his 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 entourage was contemptuous of President Obama, Secretary Clinton, um, of I think it was Richard Holbrook of of the people that were involved in the sort of civilian project version of Afghanistan. They were deeply contemptuous of them. Of them, he helped to cover up Pat Tillman's friendly fire incident. He he had a also when he was running JSOC, I don't you could you, people are going to pat them on the back him and uh, and Mike Flynn, but a lot of the things that went down in JSOC, if you actually dig into it, were us training and equipping special ops versions of Shia militias in Iraq so they could exact revenge on the Sunnis. So Stan McChrystal standing up to Trump and getting getting shot down. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that Stan McChrystal at this point is able to recognize, just as any one of us has recognized, that um, that Trump is a fucking moron. But we knew that in 2015. We knew that since time immemorial. Um, so when I look at, at a leader like Stan McChrystal, I don't know. Um, look, look, I here's just, the thing about Stan McChrystal for me. So in 2010, when he was in charge of Afghanistan, he fucking closed down all of the fast food joints in Kandahar. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why would you have fast food joints in Kandahar and, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan? By that time, we had been there for about nine years. Of course, there's going to be some permanent structures. Uh, there were fucking, you know, haircut places there. And I mean, not just like to get your, your high and tight. I mean, like there were salons. There were places you could get your nails and your, your pedicures and stuff. There were Pizza Hut. There was, you know, clubs and stuff. You know why? Because war fucking sucks. And just because you're at war and you know you're going to be there for a while, so you might as well build a fucking Burger King. So Stan McChrystal, who every glowing fucking op uh, ad about him that came out when he took command in Afghanistan about how he only eats one meal a day and he doesn't do any kind of, you know, uh, he doesn't drink, he doesn't smoke cigarettes, he doesn't do dip and he never has. Uh, he, you know, runs seven miles every morning. He's like, if you look at him, he looks like a fucking gaunt Skeletor motherfucker whose skin is like stretched across his face. Like no point of like them telling me about how healthy he is. And then looking at Stan McChrystal, even back in 2010 makes me think, oh, well, this man is a paragon of health. Like he, he looked like skin hanging off of a skeleton. Like well, his whole thing was he ran like 14 miles a day, but then he didn't eat until at night when he would gorge himself on like eight burritos or right. something like that. <laughs> right. There's like, he only eats one meal a day. Like he eats 3000 calories in that one meal. It doesn't, you know, it's not like there's any, but so he closed all this stuff down. And the article that, that we'll link is from 2010 about, you know, his closing down. Now in March of 2010, I was in Iraq. We didn't do that bullshit. Um, because our general, um, I think the Red Bulls were still in charge then. Either it was the 34th Infantry Division, which is a National Guard infantry, or the 1st ID had come in. I don't know which one. But um, what McChrystal wanted to do in Afghanistan did not affect us in, in Iraq. And actually, my um, the, the commanding general of the 1st ID is now the four-star in charge of Korea, which is pretty interesting. Um, I, rem- I recognized him because from the pictures of uh, of Pence uh, at the DMZ, like glowering at North Korea to like, to, I don't know, make them blink, I guess. He just sat with his arms crossed, just like staring at North Korea, looking mean. And I saw General Brooks in the background being like, all right, this is a fucking waste of my time, but okay, vice president. Um, so we didn't do that. And 
you know, a, a big part of it was some of the other officers that I had talked to. Now, from from this uh, from from the article that we're going to link, um, the news is likely to delight U.S. troops who live off rations and tiny outposts, where occasional showers are the closest they get to luxury. Such frontline soldiers routinely disparage their colleagues who spend their tours among creature comforts of larger bases. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you know uh, that that yes, the the the, the the world on a big military base like Kandahar, you can get fat from eating and not exercising because you you ride a desk and you don't do your PT and you go and eat every midnight chow meal. Um, however, those those soldiers at the small bases they come to the big bases a lot. Sometimes they have to come pick up mail. Sometimes they have to do these other you know various things. And I have seen you know they they bring a convoy. My, my the favorite thing that I ever saw was a convoy coming in from some you know fucking far distant place maybe gary owen or something comes in uh to, to to basra and they all park and then big group of people get out and they all you know light up cigarettes and start hanging out because they're on a convoy they're not doing anything other than you know need to go from point a to point b to drop a person off and then like four dudes go to the burger king that's on post and they've got a big long list and they just start you know ordering stuff and they shove it all back into the hum, into the MRAPs, the Humvees, and they go back to Gary Owen. Like, sure, the people on these smaller bases give us shit. Uh, we'll give shit to those of us who were on the major bases. I say it's, I went outside the wire a lot, so don't fucking give me this floppy bullshit. But there, you know, you you come in, um, you you come in, and yeah, you've been living off of MREs for the last you know month. If you ever done that, you know how much that sucks. And like, oh, here's a Pizza Hut. Fucking awesome. I can get some Pizza Hut now. I can, or I can bring stuff back to people back in the rear. Like that was, I think the biggest, uh, the biggest irritation that, that, um, some of the, you know, in Iraq, they were saying like, we're not going to do that because, you know, the people who might be shit talking about that kind of want that, you know, that's a, that's a big thing, but you get these generals and every time a general comes into, a um, a theater of operation, like RC South and uh, Iraq, or you know, Iraq was you know broken off into three sections. So you know, we we're in southern Iraq, um, or in you know various places in Afghanistan, Kandahar, Bag- Bagram, uh, out west in the Herat area. Every time a general comes in, a general has to come in and fucking piss all over everything the last general did and make it his own and change everything, which like is a big reason why we're failing in in all of these theaters of operation, by the way, is because every time a new general comes in, he wants to change the way everything is done. You know, you have a general that comes in and he's like, you know, uh, he he's a he's a fucking sports guy. So now all of a sudden he wants to treat everything like, you know, we got to take this down. We're at the half yard line and we got to take it into the, for the big win, everybody. And it's just like, okay, but why are you changing all of our policies? Why are you changing the way that we do everything? We have a rapport with the people here. And then they come in, they want to change everything. So I feel like that was McChrystal's thing. He's just like, I, you know, this is war and you shouldn't be comfortable here. And fuck that. Like, but that operates on the idea that this is a war of movement, and that you know, once we get to the end of the war, the war, you know, once once we achieve exactly. our objectives, that we're going to end, and it's going to we're going to go home. It's like we already control the entirety of this country. We control its borders. We're we're everywhere. We just we're, you're asking us to be some kind of colonial police, and with with a completely undefined mission. And I don't know. I mean, that, don't get me wrong. I I, fe- I felt the ire when I would have to do things periodically to rotate through Bagram, and I'd see the way people lived on Bagram. And I compared that to where the way we were living, where on the, the outpost where I was, where we didn't, we didn't have a PX. We didn't have anything, but I mean, we had running water most of the time. We had hot water most of the time. Like there were some days when we didn't, but uh, you know, whatever, that's not that big of a deal. I mean, we'd be on a mission. It would suck. And you'd be out for a couple of days. That would suck. I, I, I lucked out. I never really had to do anything relative to my friends. I didn't have to do anything that hard, but I mean, it was nice to come back to like Fab Sharana and, you get a coffee from Green Beans or yeah. get a pizza from Pizza Hut when they had it. And when I was on Bagram, yeah, fuck hell yeah. I'd go to Orange Julius and get get a, get a smoothie, you know, go go to one of these weird ass, like the Katusa snack bars for the Koreans, like all these things that they had there. I mean, yes, there are Fobbits. Yes, there are Pogues. I'm sorry, Mr. Rangerific. Like not everybody, not everybody is going to be able to handle their job. Like some people have jobs that involve being in the rear. If the only thing they're allowed to do is work out and clean their weapon, like they're going to kill themselves. Like, Whatever, man. That was made for headlines. That was made for like the salty E6 who loves combatives and dipping and tattoos more than it was meant for any actual purpose. And yeah, to be honest with you, having met Stan McChrystal and his uh, his the ISAF's command sergeant major when he visited our outpost when I was there, 
I was struck by, I feel like that policy was probably his sergeant major and not him, but he signed his name, his name on it. So it's that and Pat Tillman is your legacy. You're, you're the boner killer, dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, uh, he, he, you know, uh, more importantly, he covered up uh, the friendly fire incident that was uh, what killed Pat Tillman, that, which which, which what didn't come out until 2007, I think. And Pat Tillman was yeah, killed in 2004. And, and, and it took, it, yeah, he was killed in 04, and it took a lot of pressure from Pat Tillman's family. Yeah. Um, they made the decision to to burn Pat Tillman's uh, body armor and his gear because it showed evidence that he was hit with American munitions. Um, I don't know. I, I, I look at it that... When I think about Stan McChrystal, so my impression of him, when I read that article that Mike Hastings wrote in 2010, I felt as though we were never going to win in Afghanistan, and he knew it, and he had something of an impossible mission. And there was a part of that article that really struck me, because uh, a soldier... uh, I want to say it was an NCO basically just sent him an email on SWA, like on the Afghan email exchange. And basically was like, I don't think you care about us. You want us to do these bullshit missions with terrible rules of engagement and you're getting our soldiers killed. You don't know what it's like. And which is bold move for a, for an E6, but obviously the guy felt it. And Stan McChrystal was like, you know, I, I, that hurts my feelings. I don't believe that's the case. I will come down and I'll walk a patrol with you. And he went down and he walked patrol with them and went out and he's like, yeah, fuck it. I'm, I'm going, I'm, I'm going to go out, going to do a night patrol with these guys. Like, I don't need special shit. Like, I'm just going to go out and walk patrol. I walked plenty of patrols in my life. He did that. And I, I, I imagine that he six got hemmed, hemmed up to fuck. But I mean, they probably couldn't, couldn't formally punish him because ultimately the ISF commander came down and, and met with these soldiers. But obviously there was some, there was some, some drama going on. You know, there was, by the time that things had gotten down to that company, they had made their rules of engagement very strict and the soldiers felt that they were being, you know, they were being denied air support. They were being denied uh, indirect fires. They were being denied all sorts of things uh, because they were worried about collateral damage. And to, to my eyes, I don't know what that was like. I don't know if that was soldiers being over dramatic or maybe it was true. I have no idea because it's all been reported to me through what I read in my casings article. Um, but what I do know is a couple of months later, a private in that unit died. He stepped on an IED and got killed. And that staff sergeant wrote back to Stan McChrystal and said, you know, this kid really looked up to you. He was really impressed by you when you came down and you 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 walked that patrol with us. We're having a memorial ceremony for him. It would mean a lot to us if you came. And he did. And he gave a speech and he basically said, to win this war is going to require us to be out there in dangerous places and to take huge risks. And it's going to end up with more people dying in the process and no one likes it. No one is going to enjoy it, but it's the only way we're going to win. And as it was reported in the story, basically nobody clapped, nobody said anything. They're all just like, yeah, fucking what shit. And it was like this really dark moment in that story. And everybody remembers the, the idiotic general staff just being dumb you know, d- dancing the Yatan and making gay jokes and, you know, talking, talking shit about the president, talking shit about Hillary, about everyone else. But to me, that moment was kind of solidified in a way that like he knew that the war in Afghanistan could never really be won unless we were going to become a permanent sort of Philippine constabulary. And that wasn't going to happen. And the closest way to the way to get closest to it would be to take risks um, that would involve a lot of American soldiers getting killed. Well, he and, he is the one that told Mom, uh, Pompeo we need to muddle along in Afghanistan. Yeah. And uh, I guess when I say that, like maybe I sound like I'm defending him. I just feel like when I think about him as the ISAF commander, I met him very briefly and I have no idea if he was a good dude or not. I feel like a lot more senior people must have known early on that what we were doing in Afghanistan was going to be useless and was never going to accomplish anything. And they have one by one allowed this to happen and they get to live with that for the rest of their lives, but they're, they're still alive. All right, everybody. Uh, so this week we're going to be for your bonus episode, we're going to be releasing our review of in the army now by Polly Shore, uh, not by Polly Shore, starring Polly Shore. Um, and, uh, uh, a delightful, uh, romp into, uh, comedy military. So, uh, that will be available at the $3 level on our Patreon. Remember, we release uh, bonus stuff every week at this point. 
So if you are not a Patreon at this point, uh, you know, $5 gets you access to everything. $3 gets you access to about two a, uh, a month. And then $1, uh, a lot of our bonus stuff, um, book reviews, uh, movie, you know, uh, little uh, smaller reviews. I'm going to be reviewing uh, every episode of things like Band of Brothers and Generation Kill on my own, uh, as well as I'm doing book reviews. Uh, I keep trying to read Jordan Peterson's 12, uh, 12 Rules for Life, and like I'm about 12 pages in, and he won't shut the fuck up about the lobster, so I'm... I'm struggling through it, but I'm gonna try to make that into a book review if I can do if I can do it without like telling my wife that she needs to uh, you know spend more time cleaning and making me sandwiches or whatever the fuck his philosophies are. You can follow me at Army Strang, follow Nate at In These Deserts, and uh, get us on Patreon.com/slash Hell of a Way to Die. Um, we are we've resurrected our YouTube as well. Hopefully, we'll be doing some uh, some content there. And if you want to get on the newsletter once a week, uh, the the podcast Twitter Hell of a Way uh, has pinned uh, at the top of it the the link to sign up. So just pop your email in there. We send out uh, you know codes, promo codes for our T-shirts, and just kind of you know little news and everything. Nothing too much. I'm not trying to bombard you with too much uh, stuff in your inbox, but it's a good little newsletter uh, that I really enjoy putting together. So. If you want to get that into your inbox as well, uh, you know, if like Twitter and Facebook aren't that great for you for getting stuff, I will get I will get you shit. I will get you information however I can. I will put it in front of you and ask you for your five dollars a month. Trust me. So um, so as always, Nate, thank you so much. And everybody, we will talk to you next week. Yep. Have a good one.